So now we, we can actually make a document. Yeah, of course, it's time for all good men to come to the aid of their country. Okay, so, <laughs> so you know, it's just a standard word processor with a, with, um, uh, a bunch of commands, so for example, and, 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 and this has a prompt, so if you don't know what the commands are, you just... Um, uh, it's like man, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so anyway, that's, that's sort of how, how it works. How long um, did it take you to write, to create, write, write, write master? Well, I started writing it in 1978, um, and I finished it probably in 1979, the first release was then. Was then. But you know, we kept working on it through my the time I le left Kremenko in 1983. Did you write it in Structure Basic? No, it was written in uh, uh, Z80 assembly language. Gotcha. Because it had to be really, really small. Really small. Yeah. Um, and in fact, what hap what happened was I didn't know the the, the Kremenko CDOS operating system. Uh, see, Chromemco had its own operating system. Rather than run on C CPM, mm -hmm. which was the operating system that most S100 microcomputers ran on, Chromemco had their own operating system called CDOS, which is actually part of one of Chromemco's business mistakes because their computer was not standard with everyone else's. But anyway, so uh, uh, we had CDOS didn't have a virtual memory. Mm. And so I had to write. I had to create virtual memory for work for WriteMaster because many word processors of that of that day, you were limited to a document that would fit entirely into memory. Right. You know, electric pencil, I think, was the name of one. That's right. Yeah, Michael Schreier. And and yeah. that doc, that word processor said, "Well, you're out of memory. You can't make your document any bigger." <laughs> and so what what I did in WriteMaster was I created a virtual memory system so that it could page stuff out into. Yeah. I, I had to disk. do that myself with image editors on those machines. Yeah, uh, yeah. And so, so that's. Oh, so let's get out of here because I actually want to show you something else. Um, uh, let's see. So, uh, quit, quit, and it'll say the way you want to save your document. Oh, right. It's telling me it can't find. It can't find right master because actually. The disk yeah, it's in there. The two floppy system. Uh, and normally, what would happen is you would have this disk in one floppy, and the other disk in um, <coughs> oh well, we're back in in work in here. Let me let me just uh, let me just say quit. I remember this this issue. Escape. Quit. Um, do you want to save the document you've been editing? I don't want to save it. Text not saved. Goodbye. Okay, so it puts us back to the to the main menu. Um, so normally, what would happen is you'd have the main disk in this in this drive, and in your other drive, you'd have the working disk that you're that you're creating your your documents on. Gotcha. Okay, but what I want to show you actually, let's get out of this. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, control C. I don't know if that's going to work. Or, or uh, no, it's not going to know what quit is. <laughs> it's been a long time since like your command not found. <laughs> this is one of the, the the things that was funny about these old computers is that you you there were commands that you had to remember. It's sort of like Unix. Yes. Um, what I want to do is I want to I want to get back to uh, okay so let's get rid of that disk and put in I want to put in Lisp because I want to show you something. oh my okay um, uh, and I don't want to overrun your time either so you tell me yeah uh, we're because I actually have to leave. Uh, pretty soon. Okay. Like. Yeah. And I want to run you around the museum a little bit. Okay. To show you what's what we do have, and talk to you about the Xerox uh, Star as well. Your experience on Star. Uh. No, I don't want to strike the disc. 
check control C. Somehow it got into the disk check program. But see what's uh, see how the okay good. Now we're back. Now we're at CDOS. This is the CDOS prompt. Gotcha. Okay, so now I can say. Um, uh, that's a DIR gives yeah. me a directory of what's in the disk. So I'm going to say Lisp, uh, and I'm going to say um, Lisp, Lisp. Um, 15. So, uh, let's see, I, I, I can't remember. I made myself an, a crib sheet here, but uh, I, what did I do with the crib sheet? Um, using Chromemical Lisp. Okay, there it is. There it is. This is my crib sheet. Okay. Okay, so we're in Lisp. It says, okay, so now we're in Lisp. And you can type basically any Lisp expression in the world. The thing that was amazing was that no one thought Lisp could run on a computer that only had 64k bytes of memory. Right, right. And then John Allen, who was a Stanford person, wrote a really compact Lisp. I mean, extremely compact. I think he wrote it in fourth. And um, and it runs on this computer, and it actually is so energy efficient. I mean, em em uh, memory efficient. That you can actually do significant AI programs hmm. in in Lisp on, on on a C10, and that was just amazing at the time. So, for example, I wrote a program to solve the 15 puzzle. So, um, I'm going to load I'm going to load that program uh, right now. Okay. So, uh, so I'm going to say I'm going to type the Lisp expression, which is Load, load, and then uh, where's my quote? Quote is on a different place on this keyboard, so I have to find it. There it is. Quote 15 dot lisp. Okay, so it's loading. It's loading the 15 puzzle solver that I I wrote. See what happened was uh, John Allen came up with this lisp. He offered it to Kremenko. Roger and Harry decided to buy it. They weren't really sure what Kremenko was going to do selling Lisp because people weren't really using Kremenko computers for research or for computer science instruction. They were using it mostly for business. But they thought that if Lisp ran on this thing that people might start using these computers for education and, and other things. Mm -hmm. So, um, But no one at Kremenko except me knew Lisp. Right. <laughs> okay. And Lisp being the Lisp hacker wasn't my job there. I, my job was to be a manager of the applications group. Gotcha. So I was writing word processing software and other applications and managing people who were writing applications. And so, but uh, so on the side, on weekends and nights, I basically hacked up this program to solve the 15 puzzle. So let's, I'll just give you a little demonstration. Um, uh, I'm going to start it out with a very simple puzzle, which only takes three steps from the start to the goal and doesn't have to backtrack. So, so I'm going to say, um, 15, start, goal. Uh, these, as I, when I loaded the, f the 15 mm -hmm. software, what it did was it loaded up some goals which are already defined into the variable s. So the starting configuration of the of the puzzle is an s, and the and the um, ending configuration is in g. Mm -hmm. Now you know the 15 puzzle is the one where you have all these numbers and you just slide them around yep. until you get them to get them in order. in order. Okay, so here it comes. So it's drawing it on the screen. This is a character-based display. So <laughs> I had to come up with this character-based graphics little setup. And so basically it's saying, I've got... And it's doing it. So Lisp running on a 64K Kremenko C10. Right, and so it's moving, it's moving the, the, the empty space basically around, trying to find the goal. Uh, okay, so actually I gave it a, 
a co more complicated problem. I gave it one in which it has to backtrack. It's it estimating. It's estimating at any given time how far it is from the goal, mm -hmm. and it's exploring multiple paths at the same time, but only displaying the path that it's currently actually on. Gotcha. And every once in a while, it has to. It says, "No, I'm getting too far away from the goal. I'm going to have to back up and go back." I and ironically, the server grid you just passed, the Evo grid, is doing the same thing with millions of simulated molecules. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's trying to find a complex self-organization and local maxima, and then backtrack off of those and then go up to higher maxima. Yeah. Stochastic That's method. That's more or less what this is doing except at a much you know, lower level of complexity. It's not using a stochastic technique, it's just backtracking down a tree. Yeah, it's doing what's called tree pruning. You know, uh, it, it does look ahead and tree pruning and, and, and stuff like that. Anyway, so this is an instruction sheet on, on using it's the wonderful. Lisp. And um, it sounds vaguely like a microwave oven. Yes. Right. Well, that was the only sound this thing could make was that that beep. So, uh, I I used the beep to to indicate that it was doing things like backing up and things like that. Cool. Okay. Yes. So uh, let's uh, see if we can quit the Lisp because it'll take it a little while to solve this. Uh, come on. Control C. Okay. Great. All right. So we are. Oh, but it. I turned it off with the with the cursor off. Um, okay, fine. So, so now uh, the only other thing I want to show you. Okay, so Lisp, that's Lisp. Uh, and there's a couple of copies of the Lisp disk. Gotcha. And these are the instructions for Lisp. Um, uh, there's one other thing I think I want to show you before we. It. There are a bunch of applications on here, and you can explore them if you ever have the time. But or you, maybe your son or somebody will be interested in it. Um, but what I'm looking for is yes, this disk. This is a this is a set of games that were developed for this computer. Now let me turn it off and back on again because I want to. Um, we should start having club meetings here, and then <clears throat> right, and then people can share this, these 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 uh, these these ideas or these uh, old things. Uh, I'm just going to show you one game. Uh, okay, so this is going to start up again.